Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. What are the most important training variables for maximizing hypertrophy? As 2024 comes to a close, I thought it would be nice to review some excellent research this year on key topics like training to failure, optimal range of motion, and ideal set volume. If you're a new viewer, welcome. This will be a great summary of the year. If you're a regular viewer, this will help refresh your knowledge. But I'll also introduce new research not discussed previously, including a fresh paper on training to failure and a study on length and partials on just under 300 subjects. For your ease, the timestamps know where fresh new data is detailed. Let's dive straight in. Training close to failure is crucial for maximizing muscle fiber recruitment and tension. But do we need to always train to failure? This year we saw the best design study on this topic to date, involving trained individuals with the highest average experience in the failure research. Participants trained unilateral leg extensions and leg presses, one leg trained to momentary muscular failure, while the other leg stopped one rep from failure on the leg extension and two reps from failure on the leg press. Pre-study tests indicated subjects fairly accurately estimated their proximity to failure and here's footage of a subject going to failure and leaving two reps in reserve on the leg press. Ultimately, quad gains were similar between both, suggesting stopping one to two reps short of failure may be sufficient for hypertrophy, a conclusion supported by other well-designed studies. However, as detailed in our full breakdown of this study, the influence of set numbers is worth considering. In the Just Detailed study, participants maintained their pre-study quad volume with a 20% increase midway. This resulted in subjects performing between 10 to 17 weekly sets for the quads. Some hypothesized though that training to failure might be more beneficial when performing fewer sets. I'm glad to say a brand new study explored this. 42 trained individuals perform this program two times a week with just one set on each exercise, thereby totaling these low weekly sets for each muscle. One group took each set to momentary muscular failure, while another group aimed to stop with two reps in reserve. Analyses indicated subjects reasonably estimated how far from failure they were. Accuracy was higher on the bench press versus squat, and they improved their accuracy across time on the bench press. Ultimately, while the differences were not statistically conclusive, the raw numbers lean towards training to failure for most measurements, except the biceps which could be due to chance. Another study a few years back found with one set per exercise, failure tended to produce better growth outcomes than stopping shy of failure. So in total, though this is by no means case closed, the early evidence may indeed suggest with low volumes, training to failure provides some growth advantage, whereas when training with a higher number of sets, stopping just short of failure may largely be similar. What is the optimal range of motion for building muscle? A brand new study adds to this literature. Firstly, a full range of motion moves the joints through the largest capacity possible. A shortened partial moves through the half where the muscle is at a shorter length, while a lengthened partial moves through the half where the muscle is at a longer length. It was long believed a full range of motion was superior, but this was based on comparisons with shortened partials. Some data in the last few years found lengthened partials build overall more muscle than a full range of motion. However, these studies were done on untrained individuals just training either the calf raise, leg extension, or a hip extension exercise. What about trained individuals and other exercises? That brings us to the brand new study on just under 300 subjects with at least 6 months of experience. This was a randomized trial done across 15 different locations. Subjects trained this two-day-a-week program for 12 weeks, performing just one set to momentary failure per exercise. One condition trained with a full range of motion on everything, while another condition trained the highlighted exercises with a lengthened partial, but a full range of motion on the non-highlighted exercises. Increases in arm and thigh muscle area were fundamentally not different between both, suggesting lengthened partials may just be similarly effective to a full range of motion. The strength of this study was the incredibly large number of subjects. However, arm and thigh area were estimated from circumference and skin fold measurements, which have limitations. Although, the authors took steps to reduce this as much as possible. 
The subjects were also not necessarily highly trained, the lengthened partials weren't deployed on all exercises, and the overall volume of training was low. Nevertheless, we did have another study a few months ago, funded by none other than Jeff Nippert. 25 individuals with an average of 4.9 years of experience performed this program. One side of their body trained with a full range of motion on everything, while the other side of their body trained with lengthened partials on everything. Increases in elbow flexor and triceps growth was similar, reinforcing the idea lengthened partials may just be similar to a full range of motion in trained individuals. Summoning the spirit of scientific accuracy, considerations still exist. One hypothesis suggests lengthened partials may only be beneficial with exercises typically most challenging at short muscle lengths, including calf raises, rows, lateral raises, leg curls, and leg extensions. Indeed, recall two of the studies on untrained individuals finding great hypertrophy with lengthened partials used calf raises and leg extensions. But the latest study on trained individuals did involve leg extensions and did not support the superiority of lengthened partials. Although, another hypothesis is that lengthened partials only specifically benefit the distal regions of a muscle. In both of these studies on trained individuals, growth was just measured around the middle regions of a muscle, meaning we cannot be certain how distal region growth compared. More research is needed to clarify these nuances. I'll also briefly add that some think shortened partials are completely ineffective, yet, they still build muscle and in some studies, not all, shortened partials actually grow specific regions of a muscle similarly to a full range of motion and lengthened partial. A deeper dive into range of motion and the potential utility of shortened partials is on my to-do list. All in all, it's clear range of motion is not the most important variable for growing. You can grow with all types of range of motions. But my current take is if you're trying to maximize overall hypertrophy, both a full range of motion and lengthened partial are viable options, so pick your preference. A mixture of both in your overall program is not impossible either. How many sets should you perform? This year we saw the largest analysis on this to date, generally suggesting higher set numbers build more muscle. But fascinatingly, strength gains were maximized with much lower set numbers. Why did I bring up this strength data? It is just interesting to know the results. But I've also seen it argued since muscle growth is an increase in contractile units, more muscle should result in greater strength. But as we see a plateau in strength much earlier, surely the growth with higher set numbers is just muscle swelling, not real growth. In the original video, I dissected whether we have enough evidence to say swelling is certainly confounding the data. We don't. In fact, there's evidence muscle swelling post-training can decrease notably as you continue with a program. So what's going on with the strength data? I would like to credit a fantastic article by Greg Knuckles from Stronger by Science. Simply put, using strength data to infer hypertrophy is not a great idea. Feel free to pause and read why. The key is that under the conditions being studied, it absolutely should not be surprising for strength and hypertrophy results to differ. One excellent example is that energy deficits appear to reduce lean mass gains but not necessarily strength gains. So, should you aim for very high set numbers to build muscle? Well, remember there were diminishing returns. Those initial sets give you a great return, while those later sets yield progressively smaller benefits. So it is certainly possible to grow respectably without a ton of sets. Plus, the credible intervals indicate more uncertainty beyond 25 weekly sets per muscle group. Indeed, there are a limited number of studies exploring these kinds of volumes, so a true plateau could emerge with future research. In fact, an individual study published just this month found no additional growth with higher set numbers. I intend to dissect this soon and have a more comprehensive video on set numbers, exploring other ideas such as whether things change as you become more advanced. For now, my general recommendation is to maximize your training quality, ensure you're training hard enough and selecting exercises that are ideal for growing a muscle, then perform as much as you can personally and practically handle. I would guess this falls around 12 to 20 weekly sets per muscle group for most people, but experimenting with more or fewer sets based on your judgment can be worthwhile. Before wrapping up, let's briefly touch on some interesting muscle physiology research this year. 
Some researchers have begun exploring if muscles compete with each other for growth. Namely, does your bicep see the best growth if the only thing you did was train the biceps? When training your full body, perhaps some of that bicep's growth is instead diverted to support the growth of all your other muscles. A fascinating study this year, though limited, found that some muscles that weren't trained actually decreased in size, possibly to support the growth of the trained muscles. This was more pronounced when calorie and protein intake were lower. If true, dedicating periods to specialize in certain muscles while reducing emphasis on others could accelerate their growth. This research is still in its infancy, so while nothing is certain yet, I'm excited to see how it evolves. Another paper published this year provides insight into muscle hyperplasia. While muscle hypertrophy is established, which is an increase in the size of individual muscle fibers, whether hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of fibers, occurs is debated. Studying this in humans is challenging. Humans have upwards of hundreds of thousands of fibers in each muscle, and there's no simple way to precisely measure this. But this study used an indirect equation for muscle fiber number estimates. They compared a group of trained individuals to a matched group of untrained individuals. It found that the trained individuals had 70% larger muscles, which involved both larger individual fiber sizes but also a greater number of muscle fibers, suggesting both hypertrophy and hyperplasia contribute to the greater overall muscle size. Though this is just a cross-sectional study with estimations for fiber numbers, I'm hopeful that as technology improves, we'll see research that can causally determine if lifting weights really increases fiber numbers over time. There's even more excellent research this year that's too much to fit all in this video. From progressive overload to quad training and training frequency, feel free to check out these videos for more details if you're interested. It can be tricky and very challenging to construct your own muscle building program, but the Alpha Progression app, which is essentially your personal clever muscle building assistant in the palm of your hand, can easily help you. With hundreds of thousands of downloads, thousands of reviews speak to its unmatched quality. Other apps truly generate garbage programs, but this app intelligently gets you closer to your dream physique. Through generating an evidence-based program 100% customizable to your needs, simply let it know all about you, your experience level, the equipment you have, how often and how long you can train for, and if you want to focus or neglect certain muscles. This can all take less than a minute, and you can still make further edits if you like. The app has extra impressive features. During workouts, the app's algorithm carefully suggests how you may progressive overload to help push you to the next level. Aesthetic graphs automatically display your long-term progress, and there is a huge exercise database of all the best muscle building exercises. Try out every single one of the premium features to your heart's desire during a free two-week trial through the link in the comments and description. If you like it and choose to go beyond, the link cuts the price of a subscription by 20%. I truly believe the app is exceptional, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. Thank you for making it to the end. Feel free to check out another one of the videos at the House of Hypertrophy.